Hello and welcome to GameSack. I've always been really fascinated with console ports of arcade games, especially since they usually have to rebuild the game from the ground up for the different hardware. So let's take a look at some arcade to console ports. That's right, console. This isn't arcade to computer. There's gonna be none of that here. Well, unless you behave, then I'll see what I can do. We begin with Rampage from Valley Midway. It came out in 1986. You play as one of three monsters whose only goal is to smash all of the buildings on screen. Up to three people can play at the same time. You need to climb the buildings and punch them enough to get them to collapse. And you want to make sure you jump off before they begin to come down. Often there are people shooting at you from the windows to try to stop you, as well as helicopters and other things on screen that will damage you. You have a life bar and when it drains you turn back into a human. I like how you're embarrassed to be naked as you scooch off the screen. There are items that you need to watch out for, like toasters inside buildings or signs which can electrocute you and cause damage. If you eat food or people, you can get a little bit of life back. There are a total of 128 days in the game. It loops several times after that and there's no real ending. The graphics are an interesting mix of low and high resolution visuals. They don't vary much at all from city to city and no attempt is made to look like their real life counterparts. There's lots of chaotic sound effects going on. There's no music except for a little ditty that plays once in a while between stages. All in all, I love this one at the arcade. Rampage came home to the NES in 1988 from Data East. This one's pretty watered down as you might imagine, but it plays okay. They got rid of the wolf character and now it's just a two player game. They did make a small effort to change the stages up a little, like these snow covered trees in Amarillo, Texas. After you beat five stages, you now have a screen where it shows that the monsters are done with that area of the country. You also occasionally get a bonus stage where you need to search for an item hidden in the building before the unseen timer runs out. This one gives you a lot more healing items as you smash buildings. They also added music, but it's pretty basic and it doesn't seem to change except for the bonus stages. It's a fairly typical port for the console, I'd say. Rampage came to the Sega Master System courtesy of Activision, also in 1988. This port was developed by Sega themselves. As you can see, it's the brightest and most colorful version of the game yet, but the backgrounds still don't change much or often. What this game does do, however, is play quickly. It's by far the smoothest and fastest playing version. It's easier to affix yourself to buildings and it's super fun to bring them down. Again, it's only two players, but at least you can choose between all three monsters. This one also has some original music that never changes, but it's a better tune than the NES version. What's more is that this game has an FM version of that soundtrack. Since this game was never released in Japan, the FM music was never heard in its own time during its retail life. That's because at the time, only the Japanese hardware was capable of playing the FM sound. The FM music here sounds great, however, the sound effects themselves are very quiet. They're much more pronounced and lively if you play the game with the normal PSG soundtrack. However, the low life warning sound is much less annoying in FM. Check it out. Overall, this is a fantastic yet still repetitive conversion. Nineteen eighty nine brought Rampage to the Atari VCS, also known as the twenty six hundred. It looks as bad as you'd expect it to, but still decent for the hardware. Since the console only has one button to work with, it defaults to jumping. If you want a punch, you need to hold a direction when you press the button. It is rather odd. It's also difficult to discern the damage you make to the building and where you can climb a damaged building. But you can still choose from all three monsters and even the colors change for each screen. Thank you. 
Rampage also showed up on the Atari 7800 that same year. This one looks a lot more detailed than the 2600 version. Still though, it's definitely a far cry from any of the others. Here we get two button gameplay, but diagonals aren't allowed. So you need to press straight down to punch a building while descending it. The sound isn't much more advanced than the 2600 game, but there's more here for sure. Again, we get two players simultaneously and the ability to choose from all three monsters. Nineteen eighty nine also brought Rampage to the Amiga. Yeah, I know, I said no computers, but screw it, I'll show the Amiga stuff if I can. It's about as interesting as the computer stuff gets. This one lets three players play at the same time. In fact, I couldn't figure out how to get a single player game running. I'm dumb, I know, oh well. This one moves really fast, but instead of being smooth like the Master System game, it's kind of twitchy. Like the 2600 version, you only have one button, so you need to hold a direction while you press it to attack, otherwise you jump. I still couldn't quite get used to this. The graphics are pretty good with bright colors. The sound effects are great, even better than the arcade. If this had two button gameplay, this one would absolutely be recommended. In 1990, Rampage came to the Atari Lynx from Atari themselves. This is almost a complete reimagining of the game's visuals and audio. The stages now scroll horizontally and vertically in order to keep the player characters big. There's quite a bit of detail added to the buildings and things, and each stage makes an attempt to be at least a little unique. Not only that, but most stages have their own music. It's not good stuff, mind you, but it does add some variety. Although this is a one player game, you can choose from the original three monsters as well as a new rat character. That's right, only the Atari Lynx lets you be a rat. The sound effects are clear and busy, giving the arcade sound a run for its money. It doesn't control as smoothly as the Master System game, but it's still a very high quality port and it's quite fun if you like Rampage. Most all of these ports are pretty good. My personal favorite is the Master System version, mainly due to nostalgia and the smooth gameplay. But don't sleep on the Lynx port, or even the Amiga version. The least good port is obviously on the 2600. The Super Nintendo doesn't have a ton of arcade ports on it, unfortunately, but I was able to find this next one. In fact, I was surprised that it began its life as an arcade. This is Blazion from Atlas, released only in Japanese arcades in 1992. Maybe it's supposed to be Blaze On, but it's not styled that way, so Blazion it is. Don't get mad at me, get mad at Atlas. This is a horizontal shooter that has a unique idea. You can freeze some of the enemies. If you merge your ship with them, you can take over their body and have their abilities. This will also let you take an extra hit or two and you'll need all the help you can get with this game. There's a super cool animated intro which gives you a glimpse at how all of this works. This is way more entertaining than a tutorial, I say. Normally, your slow little ship has a pea shooter with the main button and a more powerful missile that fires slower which can freeze enemies for you to take over with the other button. The second button will also do different things depending on what form you assume and sometimes its uses are limited in number. For example, in some forms you can fire off a bomb attack, or in another form it'll let you be invincible for about 10 seconds or so. This game is extremely tough. Still, with some perseverance it's doable, you'll just need a little more here. The graphics are pretty nice, though certainly not advanced for a 1992 arcade game. The music is also quite nice, but you'll probably quit playing out of frustration before you hear much of it. That very same year, Blazion came home to the Super NES in its only home port, also from Atlas. It's a fairly faithful port, all things considered. The cool opening intro is gone because it was just out of the memory budget. The gameplay is the same, though it feels like the game is advancing slower even though your ship moves at the same speed as the arcade. The game is now single player only, though there is a difficulty select. Playing on easy doesn't help much. There have been some minor changes in stage design. Some enemies are missing, or there's different enemy placement, things of that nature. 
Nothing too huge, it does a fairly good job of staying close to the arcade as a whole, but I'd be surprised if anyone wanted to play that long in both versions to fully appreciate the differences. The graphics have been downsized a bit. It looks a bit chunkier and often more sparse in spots. The music is still very nice, but the sound effects are horrendous, man. If you have to play this shooter, play the arcade version. However, I'd recommend that you play an entirely different shooter instead. Here's Alien Storm from Sega, released to the arcades in 1990. This is the fourth game from Team Shinobi, following Shinobi, Golden Axe, and then Altered Beast. Like Golden Axe, this one's a beat-em-up, but here you're trying to kill aliens. In fact, it's your job. You see, you need meat for your alien burgers that you sell, and where else are you going to get it? You choose between three different characters, though, just like Golden Axe, only two can play at the same time. You have your main melee attack, which includes the occasional range attack, but it's not a true ranged attack. Another button can dash you across the screen if you need to. The third button is your super bomb attack, which you can do just as long as your energy meter has enough energy in it. After defeating enemies, you can often get these yellow things, which will increase your energy meter. Very rarely do you get something that increases your life meter. Each character's super attack is unique. Other than that, there is no tactical advantage to any one character over the others. A few times in each stage, you'll go inside and suddenly the game turns into a first-person crosshair shooter. The scrolling back and forth looks great as the graphics get a lot more detailed in these segments. Lastly, there are some spots where you run really, really, really fast and you can fire off ranged attacks. You can also jump. These segments tend to be fairly short. There's the occasional boss fight, but there aren't too many across the game's six stages. The game is quite enjoyable, but it does get a touch fatiguing earlier than it should despite the developers doing their best to keep things fresh by changing the styles of play. The graphics are great for their time, especially in those first-person segments like I mentioned. Each character has a few things that they say all the time, and it's really loud. Disgusting. The robot is barely understandable. Yeah. Oh. But the main guy is super late 80s to the core. Bad breath, man. You're a ghost, dude. Yep, yeah, never, dude. This is a great game, but I personally prefer Shinobi and Golden Axe. Hey, this champ. The next year, Alien Storm came home to the Genesis. Here, the gameplay remains mostly the same. You have the beat-em-up segments, the first-person crosshair shooter segments, and the running segments. You can still play two players simultaneously, and you can select from all three characters. There are eight missions in this one instead of six like the arcade. However, the stages here are all a bit shorter. In fact, the game as a whole will take you less time to play through than the arcade. The stages have all been mostly redesigned as well. It's not as significant as the changes we got in the home ports of Shadow Dancer and Eswat, but this one doesn't try to follow the arcade too closely. However, some of the stages are quite similar, especially towards the end. The character's connection with their alien burger's job is now gone. I guess now they're just saving humanity or something dumb. The graphics aren't bad, but they're not impressive for a Genesis game from its own time. Well, except for the indoor segments, these still look pretty cool. The voices are all gone except for a few quiet grunts, and the music is, is a little bit more abrasive. They added a dual mode where you can go from screen to screen pitted against a number of enemies each. You have one life and there are no life or energy refills. You just keep going to see how far you can get. This port is still fun, but I think probably everybody would enjoy playing the arcade version more. Alien Storm also came to the Sega Master System that same year, but it was never released in the US. This version tries to be a bit more like the arcade, kinda. Still, like the Genesis game, it's kind of its own thing. This one is a single player game, and you can't choose the female character. However, her special attack replaces the guy's special attack in this one. 
Like most Master System games made after the Genesis was released, it's not that great as the more experienced programmers and designers were working on the 16-bit titles. This one is very slow and the collision isn't good at all. The three different styles of stages are all here, but the crosshair shooting segments lose the parallax scrolling even though the Master System could definitely do more impressive stuff than this. Many of the stages seem much longer than the arcade, especially the first person stages. You have all of your moves, but you need to press both buttons simultaneously to do your special attack. Also, when you continue, you start at the beginning of the current scene instead of right where you are. It seems like they felt obligated to make this, but didn't really want to. Alien Storm even came to the Amiga in 1991. This one makes the biggest attempt to be like the arcade. It's also the worst playing version. I mean, it was developed by the reviled Tier Tech, so what do you expect? All of the gameplay styles are here, but the game is very choppy and the controls quite laggy. It takes forever to defeat even a single enemy. The game can't even draw the entire screen. Notice the huge black area at the bottom. Well, what can I say? Now you know this version exists. It should come as no surprise that the best port of Alien Storm is on the Genesis, even if it's not exactly the same game. The worst one by far is on the Amiga. Stay away from that one. These next two games aren't tremendously well known, especially the first one. I mean, not every arcade game is Street Fighter 2 or Pac-Man, but that doesn't mean they're not worth checking out at a time that's convenient for you. This is Time Soldiers, and it's from Alpha Denshi before they helped design the Neo Geo. This is a two-player overhead run-and-gun game from 1987. You move your guy around and shoot your normal shot with one button and your upgraded guns that you collect with another button. You can fire both at the same time because of this. The special weapons that you collect have their own life meter that depletes as you use it and then it goes away. There's also a P icon that changes you into a giant muscle man, letting you take an extra hit. Your weapons can be beefed up in this mode as well. Otherwise, it's one hit and you're dead. And I'm kind of getting the impression that dying is not a pleasant experience for these guys at all. Oh man, I am so sorry. This game has one of those rotary joysticks, which is how arcade developers love to do the overhead running guns back in the day. You can rotate it left or right, and it clicks into one of 12 different directions. Personally, I prefer a strafe button, but hey, what do I know? Anyway, you're trying to rescue your comrades who've been trapped in time. At the beginning of a stage, you're told what time period they're in. Occasionally, you'll come across time warps during a stage, which will take you someplace else. Once you get to the time period that your buddy is in, you want to avoid these time warps and just keep going until you get to the big boss of that stage. Defeat it and rescue your buddy. If you accidentally warp out of a stage you need to be in, you'll have to keep going through the other stages until you get back to where you need to be. Once all of your special friends are rescued, you go to the final stage, which doesn't let you continue at all, so watch out. Overall, the graphics are a touch subpar for a 1987 arcade game and the sound quality even more so. It's still really fun to play a few times, though. Time Soldiers came to the Master System in 1989 courtesy of Alpha Denshi themselves. This retains the two-player overhead run-and-gun action for the most part. The premise is the same. You need to work your way through the time periods to find the boss of the specific one and defeat it. The gameplay here resorts to having you fire in the direction that you're pressing on the D-pad, and there is no strafe button. Aiming can sometimes feel a touch weird, as it can be difficult to hit your enemies. You still get independent firing buttons for your main and special weapons, though. They changed some of the special weapons due to the sprite limitations of the console. The stages are similar to the arcade, but the layout has been mostly redesigned. They did do their best to get the bosses in here, and they look pretty good, even though many of them are just on a black screen. The sound effect and music are both pretty low quality for the Master System. But there's also an FM version of the soundtrack. 
The Master System version of this game was never released in Japan, so this is another one where the FM version of the sound was never heard in the game's retail days. And it's pretty low quality for an FM soundtrack, but I guess it's slightly better than the normal PSG. Overall, this is a better game than I originally thought compared to back when I first played it in 1989, but it's not one of the console's best. There's also an Amiga version from Electrocoin called Time Soldier Singular because it's single player. At first, this one seems pretty awesome, but then you realize the developers didn't understand video games very well. You have a life bar here, but once it depletes and it depletes fast, the game is over. No stock of lives and no continues, and the enemy is all over the place. You shoot in the direction that you face, and the one singular button fires your regular shot, and if you get a special weapon, that same button now fires that. The graphics are pretty good and take up the full screen. You have your choice of music or sound effects, but not both, because of course. The music is pretty awesome. I wish we could have had both simultaneously. The music seems completely original too, nothing to do with the arcade. I don't know why they do that. The Master System wins the best port of Time Soldiers, but there's not a lot of competition. Vigilante from IRAM arrived in the arcades in 1988, published by Data East in North America. This began development as a follow-up to the arcade game Kung Fu Master, which itself got a port as Kung Fu on the NES. It's a horizontally scrolling beat-em-up. Madonna has been thrown into a van and kidnapped by the skinheads. Yes, that Madonna. Rather than call the useless police, you decide to get her back yourself. Hence the name of the game. You have your blue overalls and that's all you need to beat up the skinheads. It's also kind of interesting how many of these skinheads have hair. The gameplay offers two buttons, one for punch and the other for kick. If you want to jump, well, you'll need to press up. You can also pick up some nunchaku for some fast attacks at a slightly longer range. As you take hits, they'll eventually fly away. The enemies do not stop coming. They often use attacks that have further reach than you do, which is awesome! If they get too close, they grab and choke you while your life drains. This is also awesome! Naturally, each stage ends with a boss fight. The game can be pretty tough as the controls feel stiff, but back in the day, I didn't care as I was playing this at the local arcade. I was having a hell of a time. The graphics were good for their day, and they had some parallax scrolling in three of the game's five stages. The sound and the music are pretty enjoyable. Each boss taunts the player with the same indiscernible voice. Hayakama. 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 I'd probably say that it doesn't hold up too well these days unless you have some nostalgia for it like I do. Vigilante came to the Sega Master System the next year, with Sega and Arc System Works sharing development duties. This is a pretty damn good port considering the hardware. There are fewer enemies on screen at once, but that's to be expected. To make up for this, the enemies are now super choke happy, and breaking free of their choke grips can be pretty tough. The game moves and plays faster, but your attacks are slower, especially the nunchucks. The nunchucks now deal more damage compared to the arcade, where they didn't increase your attack power, just the range and the speed. Madonna's name has been changed to Maria because she was more of an NES girl. But Maria Menounos was a big Sega Master System fan, so there we go. Also, the skinheads are now known as the Rogues. The boss of Stage 2 is now just one guy instead of two of the same guys. Despite having the same two buttons as the arcade, you now jump by pressing both buttons together instead of up. This makes air attacks impossible, or at least very, very difficult. Eh, they're impossible. You can only avoid these motorcycle guys instead of kicking them off. And you can't attack this boss up here until you coax him to the ground. Sega did this because they wanted to advertise that it controls just like their version of Double Dragon. This isn't a belt scroller like that one was, so there was no need to do this. 
I rented this game way back when it came out, and I had a hugely difficult time with it. But then something clicked, and I was able to walk through the entire game and beat it with ease. This is something that I can still do today. The graphics are good, but all the parallax is gone. The music is also pretty good. This is yet another Master System game that was never released in Japan that has an FM soundtrack. The FM music is actually pretty good here, but the sound effects are not. I never understood why they just couldn't use the PSG for sound effects in these situations. There must have been a technical reason. Overall, it's a great port aside from the control issue. Vigilante showed up on the TurboGrafx-16 in 1989. IREM ported this one themselves. It looks almost exactly like the arcade at first glance. The difficulty is perhaps a bit easier, but here you don't have unlimited continues to help you out. The control is the way it should be with the up jumping, and the rapid fire switches on the controller sure do come in handy. Even Madonna is in this version because she loves the TurboGrafx-16. Who the hell doesn't? The bosses at the end of stage 2 are much more difficult to defeat than the arcade for some reason. Not exactly sure what they did here to make them so tough to hit. The visuals are very similar overall, but with a darker color palette. They got rid of the parallax scrolling in the second level, but stages 3 and 5 still have it. There are a few other minor differences, such as the van not driving away at the end of a stage and no clouds scrolling by the outside of the van window. It's weird because the Master System game had both of these revolutionary features. The sound and music are okay. It sounds a bit chintzy for the turbo. However, they did keep the indecipherable boss voices. <laughs> Overall, this is a great port, but the turbo graphics could have done it even better had they wanted to, especially the sound. <laughs> Vigilante then came to the Amiga, yet another 1989 release. This one was done by Emerald Software. It should surprise no one that this is the worst version. I mean, look how slow it moves. Since the Amiga only has one button, it does double duty for your punches and kicks. When you're standing still, it punches. If you hold left or right, you kick. The enemies here also take more damage before they die. The graphics look like someone simply described the arcade game to them over lunch and they went from there using as few colors as possible, but they could be worse. I mean, they have the parallax scrolling everywhere that it should be, and they have two guys fighting you at the end of stage two instead of just one. You have some music and it's not bad, but it's not even related to Vigilante at all. They just brought in some guy and asked him to do one random tune. That's right, just one. And it plays over the entire game and never stops. It's so bizarre. I think the game should make an attempt to sound like the arcade music. Is that just me being weird, or does anyone else agree with me on that? At least you get sound effects at the same time, and they sound pretty good. Overall, I think that the Turbo Graphics version wins the coveted prize of best visual anti-port, though the Master System version is surprisingly good and the Amiga loses once again. And there you go, more arcade to console conversions for you. Man, I always love checking out the differences in these, and as always, be sure to let me know which arcade to home conversions I should consider checking out in the future. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack.